Hello, Namaste. Welcome to Dave's Hammer Show. This is a weekly television show where I invite guests from different walks of life to discuss on various contemporary issues. Today, I have invited new guests to discuss on the roles of international labor organizations office in Kathmandu. In order to discuss on this theme, I have invited the director of ILO office Kathmandu, who has extensively worked in Asia for more than 20 years, and most importantly, he has worked in the sector of indigenous peoples. He is no other than Richard Howard. He is no other than Dr. Richard Howard. Let's, let me welcome him in this show. Hello, Richard. I would like to welcome you to the show and also request you to introduce yourself briefly. Okay, well, it's good to be here. Uh, my name is Richard uh, Howard. I'm the country director here in the ILO in Nepal. And I've been here about a year and eight months. Still have a lot to learn, but I've learned a good bit so far. So it's good to be here. You have been to Nepal in the year 2016 on August. That's right. The coincidence is that we also opened up the television in, on, in, in the same month, mm. August 9, 2016. Mm. So it is like coincidence. We have the same meeting. birthday. <laughs> All right, yes, same birthday. Your arrival and our starting. So I would like to talk uh, today about the roles of uh, ILO in implementation of ILO conventions in Nepal. And to the background is that the Nepal joined ILO in the year uh, 1996, uh, 1966, right? And so far, Nepal has ratified more at many as 11 ILO conventions. And uh, out of those, seven are core ILO conventions, right? Like uh, forced labor conventions, evolution of forced labor convention, including indigenous and tribal people's conventions, number 169 as well, right? And if you have to assess yourself, how do you assess their implementations in Nepal, actually? Ratifying a convention and implementing the convention are very different things. I mean, uh, many countries ratify conventions and don't make very much progress in implementation. But I think Nepal overall has made good progress in convention implementation. Um, you can see conventions on forced labor, trafficking, child labor, uh, where you see, if you look at the numbers in Nepal, good progress has been made uh, on forced labor and labor migration in general. Uh, you can see, you know, a regulatory framework that's pretty solid in line with world-class standards and also concerted effort by the government and civil society to implement that. Conventions on discrimination. Um, if you look at discrimination towards women, uh, Compared to other South Asia countries, you see high, relatively high labor force participation of women. And there, there's a little bit more freedom and, and mobility in terms of moving up in the labor market of women compared to other countries. Um, if you look at the trade union movement overall, uh, it's fairly strong in Nepal. If you compare it to all of Asia, I think you would say Nepal has of the strongest trade unions. So. You know, overall, it's, it's pretty solid. So if we talk uh, today, uh, I'll basically concentrate more on ILO Convention 169 as mm. this is concerning with uh, indigenous peoples. Mm. And so far, some 22 different countries have been party to ILO Convention 169. Mm. And Nepal is the second country to ratify ILO Convention 169 after Fiji in Asia Pacific, yeah. I guess, right? Right. And uh, even ILO office, ILO opened its office in, in the year 1994, I guess, and with the full-phased uh, staffs in the year 2000 mm. in Nepal. And perhaps one of the role of ILO, or one of the work, is to promote and support the implementation of these, uh, you know, ILO conventions, one six, uh, mm. ILO conventions in Nepal, including mm. ILO Convention 169. Mm. Could you tell me a little bit how, what ILO office in Kathmandu doing, or supporting, or promoting to in, in the implementation of ILO Convention 169, actually, mm -hmm. per se. Overall, you know, ILO has been in Nepal for over 50 years um, in various capacities. So I have a long history of working here. Um, Convention 169 is a fairly recent uh, development in our history here, uh, 2007. 
it, when it was first ratified, I have to say there was a lot of enthusiasm by our constituents, by the employers, workers, and the government that they saw the convention as a way of bringing Nepal together, bringing in those groups that are most disadvantaged into the political process and actually ensuring that they benefit from development. So that was the spirit, that is the spirit of the convention. But I think over the years that enthusiasm has gone down. Um, and yet there are still many challenges and needs around the convention. So the work really is the bulk of it. Making that convention a reality is very much a priority moving forward. So uh, one of the work mm. or the priority of ILO office in Kathmandu is also to not only to promote, but also to push, I guess, the Nepal government to implement ILO conventions, all the conventions, including ILO Convention 169, right? So what is ILO Office Kathmandu doing to promote in this work, in mm -hmm. this area? We, if we see, you know, that we've run in those early days, the early years of the convention, we had quite a bit of resources to help uh, civil society organizations and the government to implement the convention. These days, not as much money to do that. So what we have to do, what we are doing, is sort of integrating the spirit of the convention into the core work that we do. So the work to generate employment has to, over the next five years, make sure that indigenous peoples are benefiting from ILO and government programs to create jobs and make sure that those who need jobs the most have access to those jobs. Uh, that's, social security is a big issue in Nepal now. As you know, the government passed a a social security law six months ago and now it's time to really bring that into to implementation and again accessing social security and social protection schemes in general and more more generally requires to making sure that those who need the benefits the most have access to those those are just examples uh, we have programs that generate jobs, for example, infrastructure programs, rural road maintenance, a simple kind of maintenance and rural roads to keep those roads open year round. And that program also is working with local village committees to make sure that those groups that are most disadvantaged, women, indigenous peoples, Dalits, and others, conflict affected people, are given jobs first and foremost before other groups. So that's partly our response. But there also is another area of work related to the convention, is this global supervisory mechanism of the ILO that monitors how countries are doing implementing various conventions. In two, 2015, a case was filed by the International Organization of Employers on the implementation of 169 in Nepal. And several issues was, were raised there. Basically, that the convention really wasn't being implemented, has not yet been implemented as it should be. And so it is our obligation as an office to follow up on those recommendations. So the International Committee of Experts, through the governing body, has given recommendations back to the government of Nepal, what it should do in the years ahead. So really, that has to be a priority of helping them to move forward with those recommendations. I will talk about this mm. um, complaint hearing mechanism a little mm. bit later. Okay. And here I would like to reiterate your conversation that uh, you said the ILO Convention 169 ratification is recent development, yes. Mm. Uh, Nepal ratified ILO Convention 169 only in the year 2007 on September 14, mm. right? September 14. And many people talk about its expiry that government of Nepal can review and withdraw mm -hmm. uh, after 10 years, maybe uh, from starting from 2007 and 8, perhaps in 2008 in Nepal, government can withdraw. So what is your view? Can a state becoming a party to this sort of international human rights instrument once, can it withdraw in between mm -hmm. in regards to ILO Convention 169? Well, in the case of convention, it, it depends on the convention. So for 169, it says after 10 years from the date that that convention became, was endorsed at the global level. So that was 2001. After that, in 2000, no, that was 2011, 11, sorry. From 2011, when there were enough ratifications that became active at the global level. After 2011, so 2021, September is a time 
the next point in time where Nepal can actually say we want to remove ourselves from It's very rare when countries do that. There is an out in 2021 for countries that feel like they don't want to be part of it anymore. Uh, but that comes with a lot of repercussions as well because it sends a, a message to the global community that a country is not willing to implement those basic human rights principles. Uh, so I don't think, given Nepal's recent track record on human rights globally, uh, that it would be in a position or it would want to remove itself from this convention. I, I just don't see that and, in, 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 as a possibility. In your knowledge, uh, do you have an example that any states have withdrawn, not ILO Convention 169, but other ILO Convention has, you know, oh, at yeah. such? I mean, it, it happens. It okay. happens. You know, people can withdraw. They do withdraw sometimes. And what sort of precautions they uh, used to have when they did it? when they withdrew from being a party to that conventions? Mm. I think, you know, particular governments, or you go through particular types of governments which are more closed from the global community, which don't particularly care what the global community thinks of it, you know, that if, if, if it's in that kind of state of political worldview, it is very possible they could remove themselves. But, mm -hmm. you know, it depends on the, the mindset of a government. Do they want to play economically and politically on the global stage, or do they want to remove itself and become inward-looking and, and define its own principles vis-a-vis -vis the world? That happens. You know, there are states like that. Um, Nepal isn't on that course. You know, Nepal joined the ILO governing body, the government, as a deputy member last year. Um, they're on the Human Rights Council. Uh, I think they want to be part of the decision-making bodies rather than move away from those bodies so. mm -hmm. and, and being part of those bodies means also committing yourself to implement sometimes difficult human rights standards let's hope that Nepal will not withdraw from this being a party to ILA Convention 169 after it after a decade I certainly hope so and and I wouldn't worry too much but as an office you know it's my responsibility to make sure that we support the government to implement the convention well. So we have to do that. Mm -hmm. I do think where we are in Nepal now, with the new, new constitution in place, elections have been carried out, we have the prospects of a more stable government, we have more empowered local and provincial level governments coming into play. I think it's an opportunity to revisit the convention and say, so how can it really help the process of democratization in Nepal, mm -hmm. not pull it apart? As you have worked mm -hmm. uh, in the areas of indigenous peoples, right, as indigenous peoples are rich in terms of uh, diverse knowledge, but at the meantime, they represent uh, poorest of the poor as well, mm -hmm. and uh, they are among the victims of human rights violations if you talk about forced labor, child labor, or you know, woman discriminations, yeah. the indigenous peoples of Nepal is no exception, right? So uh, I want to ask you the question that, um, who has the responsibility to ensure the socioeconomic rights of indigenous peoples or those sort of marginalized communities? Is it ILO Fish or the government itself? And uh -huh. Good question. But I mean, clearly, the convention is very clear that it is the responsibility of the government to protect the rights of those who are most vulnerable and indigenous peoples in case of the convention. So that, that's very clear. Uh, of course, we all have a responsibility. I mean, the ILO is here just to do that, you know. And even if you look at the global development agenda now, the sustainable development goals, you know, we talk about the 2030 agenda. But the core point of the Sustainable Development Goals is that those who are most disadvantaged, disadvantaged should be those that we prioritize in our development interventions. So it's not starting where it's easy or reaching those who we can reach the easiest or in the largest numbers, but it's, also, it's more importantly targeting those who are left behind in the development process. So also another point on the convention really is that now that we have the SDGs in place, the 2030 agenda, you know, the, the convention is more relevant now for that than ever. So you have been here for uh, more than 
one year, one and a half year, mm. you have observed the indigenous peoples, not a moment at such, but their development, their activities as well. And the government intervention, government, I mean, supports as well. What is your observation then in this, in this regard, mm. socioeconomic development? You know, if you look, going back to those recommendations of the ILO governing mm -hmm. body on implementation of the convention, there hasn't been a lot of analysis from the government on how development programs have affected indigenous peoples. So overall, to what degree are indigenous peoples involved in development planning at national level, at local level? Uh, to what degree have they benefited from education programs that are going on now, health programs, and uh, even programs to develop the agricultural sector? You know, all these initiatives have been taking place for the last few years, but there hasn't been an analysis by the government. Is this beneficial to indigenous peoples or not? And then the whole issue of infrastructure development. And you see now, you know, we have enough electricity in Kathmandu. That electricity has come from somewhere and building new, new electricity plants, hydropower plants. Uh, we see road construction all over the country. These kind of products projects everywhere in the world affect indigenous communities and it's just by nature because of their locations and, and the land rights issues in those locations they do affect indigenous peoples but again we don't have a clear idea of how the government is involving those communities in in negotiating solutions when these infrastructure projects are going on so when we talk about the indigenous people's rights and uh, under the international human rights mechanism, it is the ILO mm. who adopted, let's say, initially or to the first, the ILO, ILO office, ILO, International Labor Organization, adopted two international human rights instruments, right? The first one, number one, 107, 107 into 1957. Mm -hmm on uh, indigenous and tribal peoples. Yeah. It was the same amendment that ILO office did amendment in 1989, so that it amended that same 107 into mm. 169, right? Right. One, 169. So and this those, are those two, the old convention, 107 and then 169 in 1989. And, and the reason there was, an, you know, if you look at the difference between the two, 107 was really based on old kind of thinking that indigenous peoples would be assimilated, would lose their identities and become part of the mass uh, national community. That was the kind of thinking, say, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in more recent times, the perspective that indigenous groups, ethnic groups, can easily maintain their cultural identity and also be part of the broader and benefit from the broader society and, and development processes, but still maintain who they are and maintain their rights as a community within the larger state. So 169 is very much based on that mm -hmm. notion of a, you know, a multicultural, multi-ethnic society where people live together in harmony despite their differences mm -hmm. and that rights are respected across those borders within the community. So that's a good thing about 169. Mm -hmm. And Nepal is a great country to have 169 in place because of the diversity here. Yeah, that's true. So mm -hmm. Nepal became a party to the second one, the most recent one, mm -hmm. the Indigenous, Indigenous and Tribal Peoples Convention number 169, mm -hmm. which was adopted in 1989. Yeah, 1989. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, this convention covers a lot of rights in relation to Indigenous peoples. Right, mm -hmm. right to land, right to access to the resources, education, health, and so many other things, mm -hmm. including trainings, right? And if you see the uh, human rights violation of indigenous peoples in Nepal, actually, that uh, many development enterprises, including the government, has been appropriating the resources mm. uh, in the uh, areas where the indigenous peoples have been living, inhibiting, right, mm. without maintaining the free, prior, and informed consent. This has been like a tussle, right? Yeah. And what is your observation? observation actually in regards to the you know human rights violations of indigenous peoples in regards to the you know provisions mm -hmm. of Ayala Convention 169 there has been well you know I, I can't say that I, I fully understand the degree of violations that are taking place because you know from where I sit I don't have access to 
information on that scale. You know, it's difficult for me to comment on things that I, I don't have the evidence, right? But I, you know, I certainly hear of cases where you know infrastructure projects have moved forward without consultation in advance, where people have been locate, relocated without consent. Consent, consent is clearly required by the convention. Um, so I, all I can say is that you know, the convention is very clear about the process for negotiating with local communities, with indigenous communities, on land use rights, on the possibilities of relocation, but done with consent and provided with land of equal value in a similar setting as what, what they left behind. Um, I don't really know the scale of violations in, in Nepal. You know, I, ILO country offices are really not set up to monitor conditions. Really, that's a responsibility of the government, the Human Rights Commission. Our role is to help the government to implement that positive action along what's recommended Mm -hmm. by the convention. Mm -hmm. You clearly said that this is not the I mean, work of ILO to monitor, actually, monitor the uh, violation of human rights mm -hmm. in relation to ILO Convention 169. This is the work of the government. Says. But Nepal government ratified ILO Convention 169 in 2007. It has mm -hmm. been a decade long. And um, I guess there was an um, action plan which was drafted, mm -hmm. which is still pending. Mm -hmm. And uh, the government, even though government has adopted new constitutions and now amending new rules as mm. per the new constitutions, and there is not much reflected uh, inconsistent with ILO Convention 169 in, in the laws as well. And if you have to assess the challenges from outside or as an expert of ILO Convention, I mean, let's say, ILO office, what do you see the challenges to implement the ILO Convention 169 in Nepal. Mm. Do you see any challenges for well, proper think, implementation? You know, the biggest challenge is misunderstanding about the convention. You know, that it, the convention somehow creates um, disharmony in society. Whereas the design of the convention very much is based on the notion of dialogue, negotiation, inclusion. Uh, it's a really about bringing different groups together to make sure the national, the state is well is unified uh, when it's implemented properly. So I think that misunderstanding somehow has resulted in some groups not wanting to do anything about the convention. But I think there's willingness in the government to revisit the action plan, and that would be a great place to start. And certainly ILO will encourage the government to to revisit the action plan, to implement the action plan, to look at the new state structure and you know, the provincial and local government roles in terms of inclusion and setting up processes at municipal level, provincial level, to actually monitor and implement the convention is very important for that. You know, as we shifted from the old structure to the new structure, there's a risk that indigenous peoples are left out in those processes. So it's a good time, I think, with a new democratic government, decentralized government, to bring these issues back in. I, I do think it is. As you have brought the um, issues in relation to monitoring of the human rights violation as well. Mm. If we talk about the UN convention, there are hum, uh, UN human rights conventions, there are treaty bodies to monitor the violation of uh, human rights treaties like ICC. There is human rights bodies to monitor uh, ICCPR, implementation of ICCPR, ICESCR as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the mechanism which exists under the ILO office to monitor the violation of ILO Convention 169 actually? Yeah, so I mean, there are processes where implementation of any convention that has been ratified can be put forward. There's a process for that. It goes to the committee of experts under the governing body. Uh, those complaints must be submitted through an ILO constituent organization, either trade union, employers organization, or the government itself. So normally, you know, we see kind of alliances between non-government organizations representing indigenous peoples with trade unions, for example, where they submit a complaint to the supervisory me mechanism through the trade union or the employers organization. So, and, and then those are addressed by the committee. It takes a good while, you know, it takes a good 
year or so for them to review the complaints, to verify the situation, and then the committee of experts often puts forward recommendations of what could be done. Now that was done already in 2015, and, and those recommendations came out on the convention in 2016. So we still have the body of fresh recommendations. Uh, I would not be surprised if there are not more in the future coming through. Uh, so it took a really one year long process. It's a long process and you know it takes a, a good while for governments to respond but what, what I see is over time they generally do respond. I've seen cases in other countries where they've actually implemented corrective action to address complaints. So, so recently, as you said, that uh, Nepal civil society complained to the ILOC office in 2015, you mean? Well, and there was a complaint through the uh, observations made about lack of implementation of the convention. So in recently, um, the road expansion is taking place, mm -hmm. and uh, because of the road, the government expanded the road without uh, maintaining free prior and informed consent with the local indigenous, Nyawara indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. I guess they also have filed the written complaint to the IL office. I guess very soon we are expecting the recommendation from the uh, experts yeah. committee as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I can't comment on particular no, no, cases no, no, where no, 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 this is a, what? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, an official yes, this response is, this by is, the yes, that is. But certainly that would not be surprising yes. you know, uh -huh. that, that, that that kind of thing happens because that's what's supposed to happen. We, uh, and then hopefully we can see some what happens next. <laughs> yes, so I had many issues to talk mm -hmm. even though, but because of trans time constraint, mm -hmm. I will not ask you the questions, but at last if you have anything to aid and whatever the discussions we have we have covered mm. or any rules of file office in Kathmandu from your side? Well yeah I, I think we need to very much focus on the opportunities here. Um, uh, this will only be resolved with productive dialogue between groups representing indigenous communities and the government and the ILO should play a role in bringing those parties together and having you know, very productive dialogue of how to resolve some of these most critical problems certainly is possible. Thank you, Mr. Richard, for your time and the knowledge. Thank you very much. We have come to the end of the show. If you have any queries, you can reach me at indigenoustelevision at gmail.com. Next week, I will come uh, with a new guest to discuss a new different topics. Till then, goodbye.